Hi everybody, welcome to the Walker's Guide and today we're at Bradwarn Sea, which is part of the Denji Peninsula. We're starting our walk at the St Peter's on the Wall car park, which is here at St Peter's on the Wall, which you can see behind me. That's our first stop. We're going to stop there, have a little look around and then walk around the coast to some of the amazing places to visit. Some of them ancient, some of them new and some of them from World War II. So grab our packs and let's go. Welcome to Bradwell on Sea on the Salt Marsh Coast. Bradwell is the eastern. At the car park, you'll find a big sign with some information on the Salt Marsh Coast and a listening post, and it actually tells you a lot about the area. We'll cover some of the bits, but it's worth listening to. It's only about three minutes long, but it does tell you, like I say, quite a lot about the area. The isolated chapel of St Peter's on the Wall built on the ruins of the Roman fort of Athona by St. Sid in 650. On leaving the car park, walk along the footpath then ahead of you to St. Peter's on the Wall. The hedgerow is worth looking at. There's quite a number of different species, including some oaks, field maples and blackthorn. And keep an eye out for the birds of prey. We had one flying above us. It looked like a buzzard or a kite, but I don't think it was. St. Peter's on the Wall can be quite popular, so expect to meet other people. So St Peter's on the Wall makes up the end of the St Peter's Way, which is a walk that goes from Ongar in the west side of Essex over to here at Bradwarn Sea. It's a 46, 45 sort of mile walk and it's very pleasant. You walk through different parts of Essex, through a few villages and through a lot of fields, through some woodland. And it's a really nice establishing walk to visit Essex. This is St Peter's on the Wall, and it's the last remaining part of a monastery built in the 7th century by St Sid. And he chose here because, well, it's out of the way. You could have a monastery and not be disturbed. It's also on great agricultural soil. You can grow your crops that you could then sell on and raise money for the monastery. Over the years, as you can see, it's been restored. It's had work done on the roof. It's a Roman building or partially Roman that's been rebuilt and added to over the years. And in points it was used as a barn because that's what happens to old buildings. It's only a partial remains of what it once was. St Peter's Chapel is on the edge of a Roman fort, actually is where the gate was. Next to it there is an information board, it's well worth having a look and a read. But the other thing to do is just stop and listen. In the background we've got the water of the river backwater flowing. We've got the bird song from nearby nature reserve. And we've got people enjoying themselves. It's a lovely sight. Come visit. So stepping inside the chapel, it's it's actually really quite eerie. It's always fairly cool because it's such thick stone walls. It's got a high roof, it's very open, so it's rather echoey. The windows throw light, but not huge amounts of it. We've actually got the door open just so we can actually get enough light to film in here. And this is the middle of July. But then you've got a juxtaposition of this really old building with the candle holders to actually quite a modern altar. And interestingly about the altar is the three stones in the front of it. You've got the central stone in the left and the right stone. And they're part of the talk about the Celtic mission, which is what this church is about and about St. Said. So the middle stone comes from Iona, which is a location that was set up by St. Patrick's mission on the island of Iona. One of the stones is from Linda's farm, which is where St. Said, who set this monastery up, did his training. The right-hand stone is from Lastingham, and it's when St. Said built his final major monastery and then died in 664. And it's there that you find his grave. Quite an amazing bit of modern architecture almost, on sculpture inside such an ancient building. It's actually built in 1985. Also in the corner of St. Peter Ad Munrun or St. Peter on the Wall is a little information 
centre with some leaflets and maps. Have a little look, guidebooks, maybe grab one and put a little bit of donation in to support the chapel itself. We're going to carry on walking down that path over there. So after the car park, come to the chapel, walk past and around the chapel, then down to the path and turn left by the ruined lookout station. Obviously, when you're walking in this area, please stay on the footpaths because it's a conservation area. There's lots of beautiful wildlife to look at. And if you do bring your dog, obviously, please clean up after them. So this is an interesting bit of the coast where the sea meets the rivers. The River Blackwater, which we visited further up at our Beely video, meets the North Sea. But surrounding the edge of this is the salt marsh. And salt marsh is a very, very, very good sea defence. It's natural, it requires very little upkeep, if any, and it takes 70% of the power out of the sea. It's also a great habitat for wildlife. Different birds, etc., live upon it, as well as different plants. When you reach a set of wooden stairs, walk up them. Mind the blackthorn and the plant life, and then walk to the right along the edge of the seawall. It can get a little bit overgrown at times, so just mind out for the stinging nettles and the burdocks. Try to prickle you. Black-headed terns, wood pigeons and the sand martins flying over the salt marsh, picking off insects to nibble. This will, will have a lot of bird life on it. There's actually a shell bank bird sanctuary here, which is an RSPB site for exactly that reason. But do watch out for the mammal life as well. It wasn't far from here that I saw a little weasel for a while playing. This area does have reports of adders. I've never seen one here myself. Do keep an eye out for them and if you do see one, just leave it alone. Don't approach it. It will soon scuttle off and leave you alone. And of course the wildlife, the butterflies and the bees. So we've walked from St Peter's on the Wall through part of the nature reserve to right here. And it's a bit of an oddity why we've stopped here, because it's not about the lump of concrete under my feet, although it's helpful. This lump of concrete under my feet is a Second World War pillbox, and it was put here to aid with defending Essex. As you can see, its view is pretty clear. Anything sailing by would be noticed, shot at perhaps, or just information reported so it could be dealt with by the RAF, who are based just around the corner. However, the reason we are at this spot is because of something we can't currently see, because tide is in. But when the tide is out, just out there, some posts appear out of the water. And those posts are part of a Saxon fish trap. Saxon fish trap, which has been left in the water for a thousand years, but is still visible when the tide goes out. So if you're here at low tide, high tide here is actually at the moment for us in three minutes even though I just showed four. Um, but we're not gonna get to see it today. But if you're here at low tide, have a look at those ancient timbers and just consider that that's what they were used for. They were for fish. What a perfect place to get your dinner, eh, Martin? Nice bit of fish and chips. After visiting the pillbox, carry along the top of the seawall. You may find that the seawall top gets a bit overgrown. If it does, there's usually an informal path down to the lower path. If you do come down here and walk along the seawall, you've got a very good chance of seeing flocks of sparrows. The plants and grasses that grow next to the seawall are one of their favoured food sources. So if you come in July, you'll like to see lots of them eating the seeds. And when you reach the end of the seawall, just keep with the path. It's worth having a look back and you can see St Peter's in the distance. One of the sad things about doing these walks is seeing the rubbish. And it's not necessarily people's rubbish from here, but it can be washed in from all over the place. I mean, just on this little walk, we've spotted five litre oil drums. We've spotted bottles of unknown fluids. And it's just sad. When we go out for walks, all my water bottles are always recyclable or reusable. We take water bottles that we can use over and over and over again, lessening the impact. It's just little things, but it's worth thinking if you're going out for a walk, if you're taking stuff with you, take a rucksack, stick your water bottle in it. When you get back to home, put it in a recycling.
So we've walked around the seawall and we've got to this location here and I'm not going to mention where we are exactly because it's a bit obvious because behind me is a monstrosity. Well that's my word, Martin agrees with it I think. Um, and what is it? Well this is Bradwell Power Station and it's a nuclear power station, or was. It's the first planned decommissioning of a nuclear power station in the UK. And it's going to be like this for a good number of years yet. What we can actually see is a concrete cover, a sarcophagus, if you will, around the cores which have been dismantled and are now just cooling off while they're being recycled. It was built originally in 1957, started producing power in about 1959, and stopped in 2002. When you compare the look of the power station there to the wind turbines we store at the start of the walk, it's quite sad. Interestingly, the construction of this power station is actually the premise for a book by Michael Morpurgo, who actually lived at one point in Bradwall, called Homecoming. And it talks about the animal life and a farmer who lived here while that was built. Also on this site, or just behind that tree line, is the remains of Bradwell RAF base, or RAF Bradwell, which we'll see in a bit more detail just around the corner. So we're going to carry on now. We'll actually get a bit close to the power station, but we thought it was a good time to look at it. So we're going to keep on going. We've walked around the power station now, on the path around the edge of it, but you've got to question why it was put here. Well. The answer is actually multifolded, multifaceted, if you will. Um, for one, it's in the middle of nowhere, realistically speaking. The agricultural land it was going on was seen as quite poor quality. There was already government owned land nearby at the, the uh, RAF site, but more importantly was the water. It was there that water could be pumped out of the river backwater into cooling tanks, the power station would be cooled and the water returned back into the River Blackwater. As we round the corner by Pulet Island, which is out in the coast next to us, we come across a small number of mobile homes. And then after that is Bradwell Marina. There's a whole forest of ships masts. And we're going back towards humanity. As you get to the end of the marina, there are some little concrete steps that lead down to the road. Take those, it saves a little bit of time walking around the marina and back out the front. And then we're onto the road for a short section. As we're walking past the pub, the Green Man, we thought it'd be rude not to stop and have a, a lemonade. There is a decent selection of real ales, craft beers, lagers, ciders, and even soft drinks. And food is available if you decide to have a little stop. The garden is large with a large marquee and dogs are invited in too. And the building itself is quite an interesting historical building. Have a look at the fire as you go into the bar. After leaving the pub, cross back onto the other side of the road and walk up to the junction at the end. When you get to the end of the road, don't go with it. There's a footpath next to the small little house, which is actually a really cute little cottage, which we follow. As you walk down past the small Timbercots cottage at the end of the footpath, the path splits left and right. You can take either path, however, we are taking the one to our right.
So once you've gone across the field, there's a small gap in the trees. Walk through the hedge and into another field. This footpath is very wide and very obvious. As you reach the road, carefully cross over and walk back up towards the power station. It's sort of on your left, but cross over because there is a small footpath that you can take. We're not going far up the road, but we need to go up a little way to go back on ourselves down a different path. As you get round the corner, you'll see a big grass verge. Walk across this and then you'll see in front of you the war memorial. This war memorial is for those who were based at RAF Bradwell. This is a model of a crashed mosquito, which is one of the planes that flew from RAF Bradwell. It's a nice cuddle little bench. Take a moment to look at the war memorial at Bradwell Bay. One of the people who memorialized here is Mervyn Horatio Herbert, the 17th Baron Darcy Dean McEnath, who was styled as Viscount Clive, and he was a British peer and an Air Force officer. He was born of a well to do family who had titles. His brother, who was 12 years his senior, died of wounds received in the Battle of Somme in 1916. He was educated at Eton College and Trinity College, Cambridge. He was educated, but he enjoyed flying as a recreation. And when World War II broke out, he volunteered. He spent his time here at Bradwell Bay, part of the 157 Squadron. He died in 1943 aged 38 as a squadron leader they intercepted a sterling bomber following it back from a leaflet dropping raid in Europe at which point unfortunately they crashed near Manningtree and both he and his navigator Albert Eastwood were killed if you do stop to visit just have a little look, spend some time. It's actually in a really quite nice location, although at the same time, quite an odd location, right on the edge of a road near a power station. But this is where the airfield was. Originally it had grass runways, but they were later upgraded to concrete. But in 1946, the airfield was shut. At the end of the war, it was decided it was no longer needed as part of the RAF estate. After leaving the war memorial, with your back to it, take the path to your left next to the bench and follow along here for a short way. Eventually we'll come to a footpath that we take to our right. Just underneath some power cables, you'll see a small path to the right. It's a concrete path, uh, at least to start with. That's our footpath away from Bradwell Bay. There is a nice big wooden sign that points our way down the path. Just follow the concrete track all the way up past the houses until you reach the road. And interestingly, it's still got some cat eyes in it. As you reach the end of the footpath, turn left and follow along the road. We're nearly at the end of the walk now. We've just got this little way to go till we get back to the car park. On your way back up to the car park, you walk past another pub called the Cricketers. We didn't stop here. We didn't really have time, but feel free to drop in, have a drink or something to nibble. Once leaving or walking past Cricketers, the road does become a national speed limit, so 60 mile an hour road, but the only thing at the end of it is the car park. Remember to walk facing oncoming traffic. Also remember the verge is there if you need to get out of the way. And as you get closer to the end, just stop and have a moment to look at the new wind turbines and consider that's the future. The nuclear power station has shut down, but the wind turbines, at least today, are turning freely and producing energy for us, or at least converting it. So one of the things I find with doing these walks it's just to be open to looking around and thinking about other things you see. Well, that's us back in the car park and the end of our walk. If you haven't done already, please like, 
and subscribe and don't forget to ring the bell and you'll be kept up to date with all our walks here on the Walker's Guide. See you next time, goodbye. Turkey Oak.